want you to do that last verse one more time. Hallelujah. If I had a thousand... Good evening. Good evening. Good to see everybody out tonight. We appreciate you being out on a wet Wednesday night. Well, we haven't been able to say that in a long time, but uh, how many people got rain? Everybody get rain? Uh, uh, man, it, it, uh, we got a lot of rain. I saw where somebody had that they got about seven and a half inches of rain. So I don't know what your rain gauge said, but we certainly got a lot. And over on the coast and below us, Lauderdale and Boynton and, and Miami and all that place, Palm Beach, and man, they've really got hit. But uh, anyhow, we certainly thank God for what rain we got. We needed it. Amen? Amen. And so good to have you out tonight. Looks like the crowd's down a little bit, and I guess it's just been a, a wet day for people. You know how Baptist folks are. Many of them will melt if they get wet, I guess. They think they'll just melt and fall apart. But anyhow, we're glad you're out. Appreciate those that are online. Good to have Tatum out tonight with Destin visiting with us tonight. Thank you. First time here. And then we got Miss Jill back there tonight. What a blessing to have her out tonight. And she's she's dear friends with Mary and Brian, so we appreciate them being here. But uh, I guess you can see, if you, if you haven't seen, work has begun. And uh, wow, yeah. Uh, it's exciting. Uh, it, things have really, you know, we've waited and 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 and now things have really begun to move. And I mean, man, they're moving. So uh, wow, that's exciting, and uh, we're just we're just glad for everything that's going on, and glad that the Lord has opened up a door to let us get started on this building over here. And get that get that going, and and uh, I'm telling you, I think we might be shocked if things continue to go like they're going. We may be shocked. Uh, this guy with the dirt getting the, the uh, site prep ready, he said he should be done in a day or two, according to how the rain goes tomorrow and tonight. But uh, man, nice guys, and we appreciate them, and uh, we're just we're just glad for what God's doing. So we'll try to keep you up to date on Facebook with some pictures as as it happens, but I tell you what, it was exciting today to see the equipment roll in, and they didn't get get here to about two, and I finally had to leave and get ready for church tonight, but they were still here when you got here, right? So they were here to after, after five or six, so I don't know what time they left, but anyhow, uh, they, they got a lot of work done just in a little bit of time, so we thank God for that, amen? So let's pray and do what we can't mean pray tonight, but let's pray pray for the work being done and let's pray that you know uh satan will fight yeah. he'll do what he can to stir up trouble and discourage and get you worked up and everything else so let's try to pray then that everything will go good and we'll just continue to depend on god and uh, we certainly appreciate that amen well we got a special song tonight and uh miss bella's going to come and sing miss bella come and sing are you ready can, can you hop up here? Oh, yeah, look at, look. Well, I'm going to get you a red mic to match you. I used to be able to do that. Yeah, I could. I used to be able to do that myself. You ready? Here we go. This will I am I. I'm going to let it shine. This will I am I. I'm going to let it shine. This will I am I. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it sh shine. Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bush, oh no. I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bush, oh no. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bush, oh no. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Good job, I tell you what. Didn't she look so pretty and sounded so good? 
I tell you what, what a blessing that was. Well, we're going to get ready to have some prayer requests, and then we're going to have Mr. B-Man Broden to uh, pray for us tonight, and, and I'll say more about that in a minute. But uh, on the prayer list tonight, don't forget now, uh, Ronnie Sharpton's memorial service will be here to church Saturday at 11 o'clock. So if you can be here, I hope that you'll be here Saturday morning at 11 o'clock. And uh, then uh, don't forget birthdays today was Mr. Broden turned 13, a teenager today. And uh, little Miss Kylie's birthday is Saturday. So happy birthday to Miss Kylie. And continue to pray for a church and all that's going on. And we see people saved and visitors continue to come. And uh, pray for a country and our military. I don't know if you know it or not, but if you've been following the news, you know that Russia has a couple warships right over here in Cuba. You know that? I was. We've talked about that last night at the elders meeting. And I, I watched a few more uh, things on that. And, and, boy, that's that's a little bit alarming. I know they've been there, probably been there before. And then we've got. Uh, jets flying up down the coast, keeping an eye on them. But, you know, they've got those, uh, what are they called, hypersonic missiles on them that the United States cannot shoot down. So that means we are setting a couple minutes from death right here on the eastern coast because there's nothing we can do. If they push the button, they decide to push it, the United States has no capability to stop those. That's just over here, like being across the canal from us, just about, huh? 90 miles from us. And uh, so we need to pray. Our country's in a mess. I'll be saying more about that on Sunday. It's Father's Day. Don't forget that, ladies. Don't forget Father's Day Sunday. But I'll be saying more about that. But our country certainly needs prayer, and our military, and our police, and first responders. Continue to pray for Israel. And especially for the hostage situation, continue to pray for the Ukraine and Nina's ministry over there. Uh, thinking about that, I heard a guy say, I don't know if you, I don't know if you saw this or you would have read anything about it, but I heard a guy saying, not somebody wild out of the blue, but, but uh, 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 is Scott is it Scott Ritter. He's a, he's a, he's an ex-military guy. He was saying the only adult in the room is Putin. Isn't that frightening? Because he said Putin has kind of de-escalated things instead of escalating them really to where he could just push the button at any time. And he said he was really thankful that Putin is, the, he said he's really the only adult in the room. Isn't that sad? Huh? No. Wow. So pray for that situation. That's really on my heart, I guess you can tell. A good friend of ours that uh, used to go to church with Jackie Harris, her mother passed away, Janet Kapelka, and uh, her service, I believe, is Saturday. So pray for Jackie and uh, her family. Shirley Matson's sister, Diana, was taken to the hospital this morning, and uh, they found out she thinks she's, they think she has a bleeding ulcer. And then Joe Dobbs, just diagnosed with leukemia. That's Shan, Sh Shana's dad. So I want to pray for him. Uh, Wanda's still having trouble with her knees. Priya, uh, Kara's daughter, is having tubes put in her ear on the 21st. Mary's Uncle Eddie is uh, still in the hospital. Uh, Chris and Gary McNabb still need prayer. Glenna's grandson, Andrew, still needs prayer. Uh, Darlene Stokes had her procedure today and went well. Hopefully she'll be out of the hospital tomorrow, so pray for her. Joyce Sippert's Aunt Linda passed away. Uh, pray for them. Vicki Murphy is pregnant. And needs prayer. That's a friend of Madison. Bill and Shirley Marr. Uh, and be with them. Neither one of them's here tonight. Bill's got bronchitis. And he's having a pacemaker put in on the 27th. Marge and Bill went to the doctor the other day. And they're going to try and put. And I still can't remember the name of that. Huh? I'm afraid to say it. Something to try to help her heart. And uh, that goes into the carotid artery. So pray for Marge and Bill. Uh, Les Carl's in the hospital, not doing well. His friends of Cliff and Shirley. And then Miss Ruth is having surgery on the 18th on her hand. So pray for her and Bennett. And then Bill Maher's sister, they found a, a cyst on her kidneys. And uh, so we've got a lot of people. Robbie Baker's procedure is scheduled for July the 7th. And uh, Michael Gray is still home on hospice. That's John's friend. So pray for all of them. Amen. So we're going to get ready to pray tonight. And I asked Broden if he would pray tonight. And uh, he's turned 13 years old today. And I tell you what, I appreciate him. He's a fine young man. And as I tell him, come on up here. 
as I tell him, he's my favorite grandson in the whole wide world. And uh, Grampy's proud. So I can turn around and get a picture of me and you together. So we can go down in history there. So, uh, but we appreciate him. And I asked him, I said, you know, he helps Carl in the, in the children's church and, and KK helps Grammy back there in the nursery. And they're, they're workers and I appreciate them and they're good kids. And both of them have been saved and serving the Lord. And, and people say, where can kids get saved? Well, ask Jesus about that. Amen. You know, Jesus, man, he, he always welcomed little children to come to him. And I got to baptize Broden in, in Denver uh, several years ago after he, he was saved. And then we baptized KK on the first Sunday they were here in Okeechobee. So uh, we appreciate them and love them. But Broden is going to open us in prayer tonight. And I appreciate that. But that's a big thing. I don't know if you know that or not. That's a big, ask Eddie and Brian and some of these guys that we call up to, to pray that to not used to being up front. That's a big thing to get up and to say prayer to open the service. So we appreciate you, buddy. God bless you tonight. Thank you. All right, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you give us. Thank you that you brought everyone out here safely on this rainy and gloomy day. And I pray that anyone in this building today that's not saved, I hope they get saved, Lord. And I lift up all the prayer requests to you, Lord. And I can't remember everyone, Lord, but I know you remember all the prayer requests and praises, Lord. And I thank you for everything and everybody you give us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 Good job. Good job. We're going to sing one? Yeah, let's sing one. And I better say that KK is my most favorite granddaughter <laughs> in the whole wide world. Good evening. Let's all stand. Bella sang about the, this little light of mine. So now we're going to sing about the light we've all seen, too. I wandered so aimless, life filled with sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light, no more in darkness, no more in night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Just like a blind man wandered alone, worries and fears I claim for my own. Then like the blind man, God gave back his sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more in darkness, no more in night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I was a fool to wander and stray. Straight is the gate and narrow the way. Now I have traded wrong for the right. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more in darkness, no more in night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Hey, Amen. Thank you, Miss Jean. Thank you, folks. That's a good job. That was a good job. Did I send you? Did you get the uh, outline for the service for Saturday? Okay. Thank you. I just want to make sure you got that. We got your Bibles and I'd open up the book of Esther, chapter number eight, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. If you can find any of those books back there in the uh, Old Testament. We have been on the book of Esther now for this is lesson number nine. And uh, if you remember, I think there are 10 chapters in the book of Esther. And if you remember last week, we studied about what we called Haman's Last Supper. And if you remember, we learned how Haman was, 
had planned. Haman was the second in command in, in the uh, uh, Persian government, and he hated Morde Mordecai, and he had planned on hanging Mordecai, built a gallows 75 foot tall, and was going to have him hanged, and he ended up getting hanged on the gallows himself. So you never know what's going to happen, amen? So the chapter ended with the Haman being hanged and Mordecai being saved. Yet we ended with a problem. Remember I said, well, you know, it's like it was, we just had to stop right there in chapter number 7 last week. There's still a problem. Anybody remember what it was? Haman had got the decree signed by King Ahasuerus that all the Jews, remember there were 127 provinces in the Persian Empire. And he had he hated Mordecai because probably what happened something in the family way back yonder. I went back and showed you that with Saul and Agag. Haman was an Agagite, and uh, probably he'd let that fester and boil up. And he just hated he just hated Mordecai, and he got the king to sign a decree that all the Jews would be destroyed out of the kingdom of Persia. I believe I said last week, and Haman, if we want to put types and figures or symbolic figures on things, Haman would be a type of the Antichrist. The Antichrist, you know, when he comes, he hates the Jews, he hates God's people, and so we see Haman as a type of the Antichrist way back yonder in the Old Testament. Amen? Yet the problem was with Haman, even though he was hanged and Mordecai was saved, there was still a problem. The problem was, and we don't understand this, living in the day and age in which we live and with our political system as such, and politicians are liars. A lot of preachers are liars. A lot of people are liars. A lot of church members are liars. So even though we see that the situation improved for Mordecai and for Esther, the situation was still pretty bleak for the Jews because in the Persian law, and again, we don't understand this, but this was the law of Persia. Once the king made a decree, even the king could not rescind it and take it away. You say, well, I don't understand it. That was the law of the Medes and the Persians. And that means when you said something, you did something, that's the way it was. Well, it would be good to see some of our politicians practice that. Be good to see some of our preachers practice that. We got people running everywhere. You can't get the truth. You couldn't squeeze the truth out of people. I'm a stickler for the truth. I just have to tell you, if you're ever going to lie to me, please think twice before you do. Because my daddy taught me, he ingrained my daddy. Of all the things you could say about my daddy, you'd have to say, my daddy was a man of truth. And he didn't want anybody lying. And he just ingrained it. Don't lie, don't lie, don't lie, don't lie. He should have ingrained a lot of other things in that why he was ramming that down in there. But I just, I, you know, I would just assume somebody slapped me in the face. Not hard. But slapped me in the face is a lie to him. I, don't, I can't stand it for somebody to lie to you. So, so we're going to find out that, 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 that King Ahasuerus had put this decree in place. And, and now they're, they're at a crossroads. Because he's found out his wife Esther, the queen, is a Jew that he did not know. Mordecai is a Jew that he did not know. And all the Jews in the empire are now set on this certain date to be exterminated. So let's see what happens. So tonight, I think tonight, if I gave the lesson a title, it would be hope. It's a message of hope. that The Jews had the same hope that, that, that you and I have as Christians. And God can move any situation out of the way. There's nothing beyond the power of God. God can do all things. And I'm not into this crazy wild stuff, but I'm telling you that we have a hope in the Lord Jesus that unsaved people don't have. And the major talked about that Sunday morning in his sermon about the hope. It's not like saying, I hope it rains, or now we might say, I hope it doesn't rain, or I hope the sunshine shines tomorrow, or I hope they come back to finish the dirt job out there. No, no, not, not that kind of hope. A hope that is real, that is based on the Word of God in faith in Jesus is something that's sure and steadfast. Amen. And as a Christian, we always have that. I think Major used these verses in Sunday mornings where his text came from, Romans chapter 5, 
Verse number one, therefore being justified by faith, Amen. we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, verse number three said, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulations worketh, tribulation worketh patience, and verse number four, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope, verse number five, and hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So you and I as Christians have a hope. The unsaved people don't have that. They have no hope. The only hope they have is hope it doesn't rain or hope something happens. You and I have a hope that is both sure and steadfast in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as long as we have that, man, listen, we have a hope that, you know, you don't ever, I tell people, don't ever count God out. Amen. Don't ever count God out. You, you don't know when God's going to move. It, it's almost like this building project. We've waited and waited and waited, and now things just bang, 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 bang. Things are just falling into place and, and going. You know why? Because God's in control. Amen. And God, if God did for Esther and Mordecai, He can do for the Jews. He can do for me. He can do for you. He can do for our church if we put our faith in Him. Amen. So let's look at chapter number 8 tonight. If we can get back into Esther chapter number 8. And let me give you the first point I put down in, on my notes. And again, what I'm trying to do through Esther's the same thing I try to do through Ruth, is give you what the Bible says, the Bible basis of, of, of this teaching, but also to give you some history backed into that, and also to give you a spiritual application. The Bible has to be able to be spiritually applied to our lives. Just reading the story of Esther is going to do us no good if, we don't, if it can't be applied to my life and your life. And I thought about, I thought about, you know, when, when Peter and Paul and James and John and, and, and those guys were preaching in the early church in the New Testament, you know what they were preaching out of when they read the Word of God? The Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament. The New Testament was being given as they preached it. So they were using the Old Testament. So we ought to be able to use the Old Testament and make it applicable to our lives. Amen? Amen. Point number one, Mordecai's promotion. Mordecai's promotion. Here's another rags to riches story. Verse number one, you ready? Esther chapter eight, verse number one. On that day did the king Ahasuerus give the house of Haman, the Jews' enemy, unto Esther the queen. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was unto her. Verse number two, and the king took off his ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai, and Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. Wow. I don't know how to say it other than to say it. The story just keeps getting better and better. As we'd say in the hills and hollers of West Virginia, we say it keeps getting gooder and gooder. I don't know if that's good English, but it sounds good, and you can understand that. So Mordecai was about to be hanged just a few minutes ago, just a few hours ago, maybe a day ago in the story, and now he's not hanged. Haman was hanged, and Mordecai has been elevated and promoted to the place that Haman was in. Amen. How can you figure that out? How can the role reversal just roll over like that? Because we serve a God, amen, that can do anything. So you're talking about things turning around. They sure did with Haman, and they sure did with Mordecai. I don't know who you would, whose shoes you'd have rather been in. I'd rather been in Mordecai's shoes than Haman's shoes. Amen. amen. Haman, just a few days ago, seemed to have everything. And that's the way life goes. Haman was riding high. He was second in command in the Persian Empire. Everything was going good. Everybody was bound down to Haman. He had everything that he wanted, everybody but Mordecai. And all of a sudden, bang, God flips the switch, rolls it over. Haman's hanged. And Mordecai, who the king didn't even know, I doubt if Mordecai had ever had an audience with the king. The only thing the king knew about Mordecai, he's the guy that helped save my life. And wow, so now Mordecai is elevated to the place of prominence. Wow. You know what? Here's a good lesson for us tonight. If, if you don't get anything else out of it, here's a good place to get a, get a good point. Mordecai, who lived his life by faith and trusted God, allowed God to work in his time. 
you know, guess who ended up better off? Haman or Mordecai? Mordecai ended up better off. You know why? Because he waited on God. He trusted in God. He had faith in God. Man, oh, oh my goodness. If we as Christians could learn that secret, so many things, and I, you know, listen, so many, I'm, hey, listen, I've run ahead of God. I've run behind God. I've not been on the same page God's been on. If we could ever just get grounded and settled and put our faith in God that God knows what's best. Amen. We don't have to live our life by scheming and conniving. I watch the politics on TV. Do you watch it? Hopefully you don't watch much of it because it'll ruin you. But I watched the conniving and, and the scheming and, and the trying to manipulate and, and just, that, just that evil conniving that's going on trying to elevate themselves. When really, if you could just wait on God and let God do the elevating and God do the promoting, life would be so much better, amen? amen. It's a whole lot easier. Can I tell you, it's a whole lot less stressful if you can just live by faith. And trust God that God knows God hasn't forgotten you. God knows what's going on. God knows exactly what you're going through. And God is able at any minute to change that situation if he so desires. I mean, that's a, that's a hope that we have, man. Oh, man, for a life to live by, by read the Hebrews chapter 11, the great heroes of faith. Man, by, by faith, it starts out Hebrews 11, 1, by faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Went on down a few verses and said, without faith it's impossible to please god for he that cometh to god must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him if we could just learn listen i'm preaching to myself i'm not just preaching to you i'm preaching to myself if we could just let go and put faith in god and trust god and give everything to god you know what we would live a lot better lives Amen. but i'm gonna tell you i gotta say i've known people i'm i'm talking about christian folk I'm not talking about anybody in this building that I don't think I'm talking. If I'm talking about you, I don't know that I'm talking about you. But they scheme and they connive and they do everything to try to uh, elevate. They step on people as they try to go up the ladder. They climb the ladder of success. And their lives are nothing but a turmoil because they can't live a life of faith. Amen? Wow. Wow. Mordecai, who is a Jew and just a regular person, he's just a regular guy, is all of a sudden suddenly promoted to the second in the kingdom of the Persian Empire. Man, he becomes like the prime minister of the king. The king gives him, the king even, get, remember he'd given, the king had given his ring to Haman. When you have the king's ring, that's power and authority. Because they would seal documents and put candle wax or clay on it, and the king had that signet ring, and they would sign it, just like putting the king's signature on a document and said, there it is, the king said this. And Haman had that ring and wore it proudly, and guess what? When Haman was hanged, the king said, Mordecai, I want to give you something. And he gave him the king's ring. Wow. Don't ever give up on hope. Amen. amen. As long as there's breath, there's hope. Amen. amen. I know we can get discouraged. I know we can get down and out. I know we just can stumble and, and, and get all boogered up and say, oh, God's forgotten about me. But man, please don't ever give up on hope in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Because the king, not only that, think about that in verse number one, the king gave Haman's house to Esther. I got to tell you something in case you missed this as we came through the book of Esther. I got to say that Haman was pretty well off. What would you say? Being second in command to the, to the king of the Persian Empire, running around in, in the clothes that he wore, riding on the horses that he wore, uh, rode on the chariots that he rode upon, having the king's ring upon his hand. I'm going to have to say that I'm going to say that Haman was probably pretty well off and didn't want or lack for any material thing. And guess what happened to it? It was all given to Esther. The king said, here, I'm going, to give you, I'm going to give you Esther's house and everything else. So we can see that. And then not only that, verse number one says that Esther finally brings Mordecai in and introduces him to the king and tells the king who he is. Remember, Mordecai was what? Esther's what? Cousin. 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 Mordecai I was Esther's cousin. Remember, her mom and dad had, had died or something happened, and Mordecai had taken her and raised her like his own daughter. So now 
the, the Esther brings her, brings Mordecai in and introduces him to the king. And man, I mean, wow, think about that. He has his own audience with the king. And the king in verse number two gives him a ring. Again, how huge is that? I mean, he's putting Mordecai on a place of authority and prominence. And Esther then places Mordecai over Haman's house. The queen said, I'm just going to give you Haman's house. Here's a guy that we don't know if he had two nickels to rub together. I don't know. Maybe he did. But I tell you what, he got something now. He's got all that Haman had is his. Another rags of riches story. Amen. Amen. Point number two, verse number three, four, five, and six. Not only do we see Mordecai's promotion, but we see Esther's problem. Remember, there's still a problem. Esther spake yet again before the king and fell down at his feet and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman the Agagite and, and his device that he had devised against the Jews. Verse number four, Then the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king. Verse number five, and said, if it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the thing seem right before the king, and I be pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews, which are in all the king's provinces. Verse number six, for, for how can I endure to see the evil that shall come unto my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? Get this in your mind. In the midst of this celebration, in the midst of, of Mordecai being promoted, in the midst of Mordecai getting, the, getting Haman's ring and the king's ring, in the midst of him getting Haman's house, in the midst of him going in and being presented to the king, in the midst of all that celebration, in the midst of him not being hanged, there was still a problem because the decree had gone out from Ahasuerus that all the Jews would be destroyed. And don't forget, don't forget again, that could not be reversed or revoked once it had been put in place. And again, I know it's hard for us to understand in a world of crookedness and lies and thievery that we have, we don't understand how anybody could make a decree and put something and say, that's it. That's, you know, that's, you know, that's the way they used to do business. A handshake was as good as a written document. Amen. A written document's not any good today because you get, you get a signed document and people are looking for a way to break it. And you got lawyers sitting in ivory towers are just looking and putting, putting legalese on it, trying to figure out a way how you can get out of it. It wasn't like that back then. Verse number three, Esther once again approaches the king. Now you remember, this is the second time she's approaching the king. Remember, the king of Persia, you could not go in unto him unless you were called for. Because if you appeared out there and he saw you and he didn't hold out the golden scepter, you were finished. So Esther once again puts her life on the line and goes in again the second time before the king and takes her life into her own hands. And this time, this time is a little bit different than the first time. This time she falls down on the ground. This time she pleads for, for, with tears for her people. And she's concerned about her people. She's desperate. I mean, her people have got a decree. On a certain, certain day, they're going to be ex exterminated. Nothing can stop it. And Esther goes in before the king, and the king holds out the golden scepter, and she goes in, falls down on the floor, and begins to wail and bawl and cry and scream and say, man, listen, can you do anything about it? Really, really, I, she's desperate. And, and you know, I, I just think so many times, you got to get desperate with God sometimes. Amen. You know, I get, I'm, uh, you, you, <laughs> well, I don't know how to say this. If it comes out wrong, just bypass it and just trash it, Okay. I, I think sometimes it's easy to see people saved that are less fortunate or people that have had troubles or problems or at a funeral service or when death has come to a loved one. You know why? Because they're open and receptive because they're desperate. It's hard to talk to people who've got three or four cars in the driveway, two or three homes, Boats and campers and money in the bank and their uh, retirements just rolling out the, the wazoo. And, and, you know, they've got a great job. It, you know, and you tell them, well, you need to be saved. Well, they don't see a need for anything. I tell you what, I tell you what, catch somebody. I guess that's why. I guess that's why I've always catered to the down and outer. It's because those people are desperate. 
Don't have anybody to help them. Don't have anybody to do anything for them. We need to be a church that's welcoming like that. The children's church, there are many of those kids that come in on the van and, and they're, they're sent to church, so they're not brought to church. If I had my way, if I was the dictator that some people say I was, I would have every parent bring their child to church. In the real world, though, it doesn't work like that. So many parents send their kids to church and thank God they let them, let them come, but we need to be welcoming. I mean, one time back home, we had we just finished up a new and we're getting ready to get in the building. I can hear some of you already. You know what? Kids have got dirty little hands every now and then. Every now and then, kids step in a mud hole. I remember one time back home, we just got in the building. The walls were white and beautiful. And coming up, we had, had stairs going down the basement. And coming up, you could just follow the kids because they had rubbed their hand all up and down the wall. And somebody come to me fussing about that. You know you can buy... That fly just about went in my mouth. There's a fly in here again tonight. You know you can buy another gallon of paint... You know you can get another gallon of paint. You know you can run a sweeper. You know you can do things like that. But we're not careful. We drive people out because we're afraid they're going to mess up. You know, listen, things are made to mess up. Amen. We don't want to just destroy what God's given us. We want to be a good steward of it. But dad gone, things are going to happen. Amen. Those little kids are going to come in with their nose running. They're going to come in with a little dirty diaper or a little dirty shoes or a little dirty pair of pants. And by the way, we got people that might come in the same way. Amen. We need to love them and be good to them. We need to be concerned to the down and out. Because those are the people that probably, they're looking for somebody to love them. Amen. They need the love of God. Amen. Amen. I'm going to tell you what. You say, well, I've never gotten real serious with God. Let me just mark it down. Mark it down. If you live and you don't die suddenly, you might get desperate. You might get desperate. It's real easy to say, I'm not desperate when you got good health. But I'm going to tell you what, when things begin to go south and things are not good and, and the wife's sick, the husband's sick, the kid's sick, the neighbor's are sick, the job's gone, gone to pot and you don't have any, it's really, hey, listen, then you get desperate and you have a tendency to get serious with God. Somebody asked me not long ago, somebody I was talking to from another state and they asked me a question, said, do, do you think God uses problems to get people's attention? Absolutely. Problems and heartaches and troubles and storms will stop you dead in your tracks and make you cry out and say, oh, God. You know, the apostle Paul, whose name was Saul before it was changed in the book of Acts, before he got saved, hated Christianity. He was killing people, putting them in jail. He was on the road to Damascus going down with letters in his pocket to get people in and do away with them. Christian people. And God struck him down. You know what he said to God? You know what he said to the Lord? Lord, what will you have me to do? Amen. I'm going to tell you something. You're sitting on a danger. You're sitting on a powder keg if you think God can't get your attention. If you think God can't ring your number up and dial you in and zero you in and put you in the crosshairs, God knows exactly where you live. He knows exactly what's going on in your life. He, and I'm going to tell you, at any given moment, God could stop you dead in your tracks. Amen. And you could get very desperate. Amen? Amen? I think too many times people just play at church. I've been at this thing going on 47 years. I think i got a right to say that. I've seen a lot of people, they just play at church. They come to church when it's convenient. They come to church if nothing else is going on. What was somebody had on Facebook the other day? Well, how'd that say that uh, other places shouldn't be the reason you don't go to church, but church ought to be the, church ought to be the reason you don't go to other places? We don't have that commitment today. And I'm telling you, in 2024, very few people have that commitment. My daddy, when I was growing up, and my mama had, a, had, a, had lots of brothers and people, and they always they want to come to visit on church night. And my daddy said, you can stay here, you can go with me, but we're going to church. You say, well, I don't want to hurt my family. For you. Maybe they need to be hurt. Amen. Maybe they need to see how real church is to you. We let everything, boy, I'm just hung up on this point. But we let everything keep us out of church when really we shouldn't let anything keep us out of church. Amen. Amen.
We, maybe, maybe you just haven't gotten desperate. And then verse number four, the king once again holds out the scepter, which means Esther can come in and approach him. And that all worked out. And Esther's so desperate that she asked, she asked the king to do something. And I'm sure that she had to know what the, the law of the Medes and the Persians w was. But even knowing that law, or even if she didn't, she goes in and lays on the ground and begins to cry and ask the king to reverse the decree that he had made. You say, well, any good husband would do that. Well, the king didn't do it. Because it was the law that he could not reverse what he had. And then verse number six again shows us how desperate she was. That she just thinks that she can't stand. She says, I can't stand to see the destruction of my, my people. You know, I wish we'd become that desperate about people. Wouldn't it be something we get that desperate about our family? Wouldn't it be that so something we got that desperate that we didn't want to see the destruction? Of our Listen, we got people going to be destroyed in hell. They're going to die without Jesus and go to hell and be lost for all eternity. And yet we just blow right on by it every day. Maybe we ought to get like Esther and get really desperate. Maybe we even ought to shed some tears. Psalm 126, he that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Isn't that 126? Psalm 126, 6 maybe. But I'm telling you, listen, maybe we need to get desperate like Esther got. But, you know, we need to be, listen, <laughs> we need to approach the king on people's behalf. Uh, our people still haven't really got it. Some of you have, some of you haven't. That's what this altar's for. Amen. When altar call's given, if you don't have anything to pray about, you ought to come, you ought to come and bring somebody to the altar and lay them on the altar and pray for your family, your friends that's going to die and go to hell. Amen. Bring them before the king of kings. Yes. He can do something about it. Amen. Point number three, I got to hustle. We ain't going to get none. Point number three, I see the king's plan. Look in verse number seven and eight. Then the king of Hazareth said unto Esther the queen and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and him they've hanged on upon the gallows because he laid his hand upon the Jews. I mean, he's going to, he, I, you know, he's, I'm, let me appease you for a minute. You got to realize, well, what did I just do? I, I, listen, Haman's been hanged. I've given you Haman's house. I've elevated Mordecai. I've done everything I can. And then he goes down to verse number eight and said, Write ye also for the Jews as it liketh you in the king's name and seal it with the king's ring for the writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring may no man reverse man let me get down on i don't know if we're going to get through this or not the king tells esther listen i've given you haman's house i've given you haman's ring mordecai did, mordecai didn't get hanged on, on the gallows haman did yet that wasn't enough to save the jews so he says, listen, verse number eight, here's a great verse. There's a lot of spiritual meaning in it. I don't know if you've ever seen this or not. There's great spiritual meaning in this. Although the king, I don't know if you even picked up on one or read it. Although the king could not reverse his decree, you know what he did? He wrote another one. Amen. He wrote another one. Amen. There was no law that said he couldn't write another decree. He couldn't reverse the one that he had written, but dad gone. He had enough wisdom about it. I had to think that God had to be working on that situation. He said, I tell you what I'll do. I can't reverse what I've written, but I tell you what I'll do. You write down it. I'm going to give you a blank check. You write anything you want to write. You write it with my name, stamp it with my signet ring, and I'm going to tell you what, then that'll be a new decree that'll be put into place. What wisdom. Wow. That's a picture of God's plan for us. Let me stop for just a minute and ask you if you can see it. Let me just try to briefly get through this. God had placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Gave them everything that they wanted. You can have anything you want. You can do whatever you want. They could have lived forever. No sickness, no cancer, no heart trouble, no disease, no sad words, nothing. No graves, no tombstones, no nothing. But he said, I'm going to tell you something. There's one tree out there, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's the one tree you can't eat of it. And in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. You know what that was? That was a decree from God. 
I don't know if you know the story well enough, but guess what happened? Of all the things they had and all the things they could do, guess which one they were tempted to eat off of? The one that God said, you can't do it. And Satan come by and tempted Eve, and she ate of the fruit, gave to Adam, and he ate, and God came down. Can I tell you what God did? God did not take the death sentence away. He didn't do it. I'll tell you what he did do. He killed an animal. Amen. He took an innocent animal and killed that animal and made them skins and covered them in their nakedness. And then if you go far enough along to get to the New Testament, the decree was still in place. Read about it. Back in Old Testament, the soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. Hebrews 9.27, major the verse we use so often. As it is appointed unto men once to die. And, but after, and after this, the judgment. Listen, there's a decree that God has put down. It's stamped. It's sealed. God's not going to take it back. You know what he did? He said, I tell you what I'll do. I'll make something else. And he gave Jesus Christ his only begotten son. He didn't take death away. He didn't take all that, that away, but he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll send Jesus Christ to die on the cross of Calvary, bury him in a barred tomb. On the third day, he'll rise again, and anybody, whosoever will, will believe him and trust him. You can be saved and live in heaven forever and ever and ever. Amen. That's what, the, that's what God said. Amen. That's what the king said basically to Mordecai and to Esther. I can't take it back. I can't do away with it. But I will fix it up to where, A, you can have this other decree and these people can fight for themselves Amen. and be saved. Amen. Amen. That's exactly what God did. In fact, God, you know what? The Bible said when Jesus come down, they called him Emmanuel. God in the flesh. You know what God did? God didn't take the decree back. When God looked down and saw mankind lost and plunging into eternity, lost on their way to hell, God didn't take it back. Because the soul that sinneth shall surely die. I tell you what he did do. He said, I'll just go down myself. I'll just pay the price myself. Isn't it sad that we got people today that's lost and going to hell? People every day, listen, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people dying lost every day and going to hell, and not one person should ever die lost. Amen. You know why people die lost? Because they choose to reject Amen. the offer that God gave. When we get down into the story, if we get down into it, you're going to realize, man, God solved the sin problem for mankind. He took, care of the, he took care of that decree, the soul that sent. Listen, we just talked about in Revelation 20 last Sunday night. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection upon which the second death hath no power. It's not the physical death that you've got to worry about. It's that eternal spiritual death in the lake of fire away from God for all eternity that you've got to worry about if you're not saved. Amen. And God said, I'll fix that. I'll fix that. Yes, sir, you've sinned, and you, it, you, you'll die physically, but you'll never die spiritually. Amen. And isn't it sad that you've got people in your family and people in my family that continuously reject Jesus and God's offer of salvation? It's so sad because they're not, they're not a person alive that should get die and go to hell. Amen? Romans 5, 12. Can you pull up Romans 5 for just a minute? What's where Major was? He didn't get this far. He will be there. I guess I'm getting on your sermon. Didn't realize that till just now. It'll be a while. They'll forget it by then. Romans 5, 12. Listen. Wherefore, as by one man sin... Verse number 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for, all, for that all of sin. Now I'm going to jump down to verse number 15. I'm going to skip a couple verses just to get down to where I want. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead. That's talking about Adam and Eve's sin. Much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. 
But the free gift is of many offenses under justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men under justification of life. Here it is, verse number 19. You say, man, you went through that. I don't understand. Hang on, Major's going to preach on that just in a few weeks. Verse number 19, for as by one man's disobedience, Adam and Eve, that's Adam's sin we're talking about there, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one, that's talking about Jesus, shall many be made righteous. Thank God. Thank God for the provision that God made for our sins. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Well, but the, basically, the king just told us, here's your blank check, write what you will. Point number four, verse number nine. Esther, verse number nine. Here's the king's promise. Then were the king's scribes called at that time in the third month, that is the month seven, on the three and twentieth day thereof, and it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded unto the Jews, and to the lieutenants, and the deputies, and rulers of the provinces, which are from India unto Ethiopia, and hundred and twenty and seven provinces, unto every province according to the writing thereof, unto every people after their language, and to the Jews according to their writing, and according to their language. Verse number 10, and he wrote in the king. Ahasuerus' name, and sealed it with the king's ring, and sent letters by post on horseback, and riders on mules, camels, and young dromedaries. Wow. Wow. You know what he did? The king even sent, the king even brought his own scribes and said, tell, what, tell them what you want. They'll write it. Put my name on it, sign it. And then the king, man, sent them out on camels on dromedaries and they, because they had the big province province out there they, they didn't have they didn't have they didn't have a telephone they didn't have a telegraph i'm not even sure how good the tell a woman system was <laughs> they didn't have email they didn't have text messages you know how they get, had to get that listen they were going to die it was urgent to get that message to all the way out to all those provinces around the Persian Empire, man, and that's what they did. They sent it out by carriers. It was urgent. They couldn't just take their time because, man, somebody may die if you didn't get that message of the king to that certain province. Somebody might die. And the king was urgent to get it out, man, to everybody. Wow. Because there was a day set that the Jews were going to be exterminated. Wow. Notice that. Wow. Had the authority of the king. Verse number 11, point number 5, the king's petition. I got to hustle. Verse number 11, wherein the king granted the Jews, which were in every city, to gather themselves together and to stand for their life, to destroy, to slay, and to cause to perish all the power of the people and province that would assault them, both little ones and women, and to take the spoil of them for a prey upon one day in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, namely upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar. Verse number 13, the copy of the writing for the commandment to be given in every province was published unto all, all people, and that the Jews should be ready against that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. So the post that rode upon mules and camels went out, being hastened and pressed on by the king's commandment, and the decree was given at Shushan, the palace. Amen. This new decree made it. The, listen, the Jews didn't have to just be slaughtered and exterminated. The new decree said you can stand up and you can fight for yourself. You don't have to, you don't have to just sit there and be exterminated. You can fight for yourself. And, man, listen, you, you, I got a feeling you know how it's going to be. God's going to bless them. Amen? And then verse number 12, we see that the king was sending a decree out to all the provinces. Verse number 14, the urgency that, that man, if we could get that urgency, there's an urgency to get the gospel out. Amen. There's an urgency to get the gospel out. Well, I'm going to wait. You're going to wait, and it may be too late till you get a phone call. Your loved ones died. They perished, and nobody told them about Jesus. Point number six, Mordecai's new position. Look at verse number 15. And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king. Look at this. And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white and with a great crown of gold 
and with a garment of fine linen and purple, and the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. Notice that Mordecai was dressed differently when he went out this time. I don't know what he'd been wearing, but I tell you what, once he was elevated and promoted to that place of prominence in the king's court, I'm telling you what, he looked different, he dressed different. i got to tell you something, you and I that have been saved, we've been elevated to a new position. We are now the sons of God. What did the writer say? It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We are now the sons of God, John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. You and I have been elevated. We're no longer lost. We're no longer an outcast. We're no longer on our way to hell. We've come in the presence of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We've been saved. Amen. Want to go out looking a little bit differently. Amen. Well, not be like the world. Amen? Amen. Oh, sweet songster. You probably don't know those sweet songster. It's what the old, old regular, old United Baptist used to sing, man, blow on that pitch pipe and get that note and just hum, about, hmm, get in tune. And man, then they begin to sing. And they sung that old song, man, I, 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 I took off the old coat and I put on the new. Man, when you get saved, man, listen, God takes off that ugly coat of filth that you have on you and He clothes you with the righteousness of Jesus Christ and puts it on you and you become an heir of God and a joint heir of Jesus Christ and become a son of God and your name is written down in the Lamb's book of heaven and you're on your way to glory and one of these days if you die or if Jesus comes back He's going to take you home with Him. I want to tell you, you've been elevated. Yes. Well, to walk a little differently. We ought to talk a little differently. We ought to look a little differently. We ought to act a little differently because we are people of the, of the King of Kings. Amen. Amen. There's got to be a change in you. These people say, well, you can get saved. There's no change. There's been no change. There's been no conversion. By the way, why does it take people so long to get out of their cussing habits? By the way, why does it take people so long to come, come, come and realize there ought not be no social drinking out there? Amen. By the way, how long does it take for people to realize, man, I should not be lying to people? By the way, how long is it going to take for people to realize I need to be committed to God and I need to be faithful to God and I need to serve Him and I need to dedicate myself to Him and give myself wholly over to the Lord Jesus Christ? How long is it going to take? Amen. When you get saved, you get changed. No change, no conversion. You say, well, I got saved, but man, I'm just the same old person I used to be. Then you ain't never got saved. Amen. I got saved as a young boy, and I can tell you there was a change. Hey, listen, I could get happy right here tonight and tell you there was a change that took place in my life. And I want to tell you, I've been preaching going on 47 years, and I got to tell you, I have not gotten over it yet. Amen? And sometimes I think as I'm preaching, I'm listening to the singing, I look around, I think, man, they must have gotten over theirs a long time ago. But I want to tell you, there's something down deep in my soul that still stirs me, that lets me know I'm a child of the living God, and I have never gotten over being saved. Amen? Amen. And I don't plan on ever getting over it. He said, well, I got over mine a long time ago. Then you need to come back down and find you an old altar somewhere to get down on. Because you ought not ever forget something that was that life changing. Amen. Amen. Point number seven. Verse 16 and 17. Give me just a couple minutes and I'll finish up. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. Boy, I would say, wouldn't you? Can you imagine getting that first decree from Haman? From the king that you're going to die on such and such a date in such and such a month. Nothing you can do. You're doomed, destined to die. And then all of a sudden, wait a minute, here they come. Can you see it? The post and the guards and, and the sentries and the riders are tearing those posts down and tearing it down, putting up a new sign that says, hey, you can stand, you can fight, you can defend yourself, you can do whatever you need to be to save yourself. No wonder the Jews had gladness Amen. and joy and honor. Verse number 17, in, in every province and in every city, where the serve of the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. The Jews were glad and happy, and I say rightfully so. Amen. It bothers me when I see people act like they got saved and they ain't happy about it. 
Act like there's it, something wrong when somebody gets saved and act like they get a bad case of the flu. Like they got something, man, like some, some old nasty bug is on you. And you see them, man, they just, oh, I got saved. I don't know if you got saved or not. I'd check it out. Right. Man, when I'm telling you what happened, one of the signs of getting saved is God puts joy, Amen. joy, joy right. down in my heart. And man, I'm going to tell you what, if you get over that, you're, you're, you're a mess, amen? So when you think about that, the Jews were glad. They were happy that they'd gotten this new decree. Things were going to be changed for them. And man, listen, they, listen, they hadn't, listen, they hadn't even been saved from doom yet. The day hadn't even come. They just got the message, amen. and they were happy about it. Amen. Man, we're not in heaven yet. When we get to heaven, you all be shouters. You all be loud as me. You be telling me, say, take a back seat. I'm going to get loud. You get to heaven, you're going to be rejoicing. Heaven is a place of rejoicing. Heaven is a place of joy. Heaven is a place of singing. Man, we're just going to beller it out. And we'll all be singers when we get over on that side. Amen? Amen. But listen, they hadn't even, they, listen, they hadn't even gotten saved at that day yet. They just got the good news and they rejoiced about it. I'm not in heaven, but I can still rejoice because I'm saved. I've read the back of the book, and I know that I win, and Jesus wins in the end. Amen. Man, I've got the word of the king right there. Amen. That's, hey, that's, that's better than King Ahasuerus' word. That's stamped with the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Man, that is the word of the living God. That man, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, if I don't put a shout on you, I don't know what. So you go out, I'm, uh, time out. Now, I'm not getting on anybody that goes to the ball game and shouts over that. You can do that all you want. But I tell you, if you go to the ball game and shout, you ought to be able to shout and get happy at church. Amen. Watch your yell and cry and sit in front of the TV and tears run down. Yeah, I come to church and be so stoic and so stiff that you never get emotional, never get excited, never get any joy in your heart. I would wonder about that. Yeah, right. Man, it's a, jo it's a joyful way. Now, they, they, Satan will try to suck your joy out of you. Other people will try to suck the joy out of you. Church members will try to suck the joy out of you. But man, you got to realize, man, you're a child of the living God. Amen. And man, when things get really bad and things get really tough, they, oh, man, I just have to realize, man, I am a child of the King. I'm feeling pretty good tonight. Amen. Then notice in verse 17 how it ends up there. Last part of that. Notice what it says in verse 17. Make note of this. And many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. As people realized there was a God in heaven, that this decree had not been reversed or rescinded, but another one had come out in the king's name and authority. And the Jews were going to be able to save themselves. I can't help but believe that people said there's something going on. Maybe this God of the Jews is the true God. Maybe there is a God in heaven. And man, fear fell upon them. And many of those people, you know what they did? They became Jews. They converted over to Judaism. By the way, in case you don't know this, that's why God chose the nation of Israel and set them in the Old Testament to be a light to everybody. But most of the time they failed. By the way, that's the reason we have the church in the New Testament. And God saved you, and he didn't kill you when you got saved. He left you here to live for him. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. I'm going to tell you, let me just go ahead. I'm going to quit right there. Get ready. I'm going to quit right there. Listen, have you ever, you ever, I, yeah, I was outside today. I, living in Florida, you got to have sunglasses everywhere. God help people that don't wear sunglasses. I'd gone outside and come back in. I walked in, and, man, I, I couldn't see anything. I had my sunglasses on, man, I couldn't see anything. You ever come out of a bright light or come into, or get up in the middle of the night, and, you, and man, you, you, you go through there, and somebody turns the light on, you just, light will hurt you, buddy, when you're not used to it. Light will penetrate down in you and make you squint and squirm. And I tell you what salt will do. Salt will irritate you. I'm the great irritator. Salt will irritate you. 
You don't think we'll get you a cut on your finger. Get you, get, bite your fingernail down in the quick and then sink it down into a big order of McDonald's fries with salt all over it. Take you long to jerk it out of there. You know why? Because salt's got an irritating presence to it. Well, I, you know, that preaching, I just can't stand that preaching. I can't stand that. I can't stand that. If it irritates you, maybe that's telling you something. If you're squint, sitting there squinting and squirming and, and man, you say, man, oh, man, that, 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 I don't, that, 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 get your eyes opened up. We're supposed to be the light of the world. We're supposed to be the salt of the earth. And they sung that song, that little girl sang that song so wonderfully. This little light of mine, Amen. I'm going to let it shine. Amen. Don't let Satan, what? <laughs> We're always blue when it came to that. Don't let, what is it? Don't let Satan what? <laughs> Blow it out. I got a feeling been a lot of folks, Satan's just about blown their light out. About all they got left is a pilot light. You don't know much about pilot lights in Florida. You come from the north where we have gas up yonder. Your water heater and your stoves and stuff run on what they call a pilot light. It's a little flicker of a flame. Not much, just a little teeny tiny flicker of a flame that burns all the time. And boy, when you kick that gas on, that gas hits it. Whoosh. That's the way. That's the way a lot of Christians are right there. They're running on just about, a, just about, just about like a pilot light. They're not flaming in, in fire. They're not on fire for the Lord. They're just a little pilot light. Well, they were happy. Amen. And some people converted over because of it. Wouldn't it be good someday when you get to heaven and, and you you stand in there and somebody says, you know, I got saved. I got saved because that person told me about Jesus. And you strolling through heaven, you see somebody over there and say, hey. hey Eddie might say, hey, there's Pastor Mike. He told me about Jesus on the parking lot. Amen. And man, my life was changed and I got saved. Amen. And there's Stephen back yonder. I saw him at Walmart the other day. Did he tell you that? I love seeing that guy. He might be, he'll have the best voice in the world in heaven. He might say, man, hey, listen, I got saved today. The major was preaching that Sunday morning and walked an aisle and gave my heart to Jesus. Amen. And man, I can go back in the lie. I thought about Mama Jean Davis and, and, and Cecil Davis, who were like parents to me, that when I was wayward and had nobody it seemed like to lean on, they took me in and loved me. I probably wouldn't even be where I am today if it wasn't for them. When I see them in heaven, I want to remember, hey, those folks helped tell me about Jesus. But I'm telling you, it's real. It's real. It's real. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We're going to get ready to sing and go home. I could stay another hour, to be honest with you. I'm feeling pretty good right now. Let me ask you a question while nobody's looking not, not to embarrass you, not to cause you any trouble. If it irritates you, maybe you need to be irritated a little bit. How many people can raise their hand up? Nobody looking. Just raise your hand up. Don't have to say anything. By that, you say, I know I've been saved. I know I've been saved. I know I've been saved. I'm on my way to heaven. Thank God. Maybe you're here tonight. You've never really met Jesus. You've never really been saved. Man, you ought to, man, that, I tell you, you ought to want to be saved. Is there anybody tonight would just slip their hand up? I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. Nobody looking, but would you have enough courage to raise a hand up and by that, that would say to me and to God, I need to be saved. I need to be saved. Man, listen, if you're not saved, you ought to be saved. You ought to come to Jesus before it's too late. Maybe you're here and you're not living the way you ought to live. Maybe you've been saved. Maybe your life's in shambles. Maybe you're not living like you ought to be living as a Christian. Won't you come to Jesus tonight while we sing? Let's stand. You don't have anybody to pray for? Come and pray for me. Pray for an unsaved person while we get ready to sing tonight. There's a land that is fairer than day. And by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way 
to prepare us a dwelling place there. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. We shall sing on that beautiful shore the melodious song of the blessed, and our spirits shall sorrow no more. Not a sigh for the blessings of rest in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore. Thank you for being here tonight. Don't forget Ronnie's memorial service on Saturday. It's 11, right, Miss Joanne? 11 o'clock. So come out and be with us and fellowship with the family and the church folks as we give Ronnie a good memorial service. Lord, thank you for the night. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for the people that were out tonight, Lord, our visitors and our church folks and people online. And Lord, I pray that the Word of God would go out and not return void, but it would do what you would have it to do tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh.